All around the world, from the savannas of Africa to remote islands in the Pacific, there is a mass extinction brewing. All right, start counting. Elephant seven. Species are vanishing at roughly 100 times the normal rate. If current trends continue, African elephants could be extinct in as few as 20 years, and coral reefs gone soon after that. The insects that pollinate our food are in trouble, as are these plastic-filled birds. In all, biologists fear the unthinkable. Three quarters of all known species could disappear in just a couple centuries. We've never seen anything like this. In all of Earth's history, there have only been five mass extinction events, one of which killed the dinosaurs. Now, biologists say we are on the verge of the sixth. What are we doing to cause this, and is it too late to stop? CNN reporters traveled the globe trying to understand the vanishing. Have you ever been within the presence of an African elephant? A six-ton monolithic structure walking across the African savannas? These are emblematic creatures of the African continent. They are symbols of Africa, symbols of freedom. I've come to Botswana to meet elephant ecologist Mike Chase. For Chase, protecting elephants is a lifelong struggle. Botswana was long a refuge for wild elephants as poachers decimated herds to the north. But now, the poaching wars are on its doorstep. Now it seems like there's a disturbing uptick in the poaching on the borders of Botswana and Namibia and this bull was killed it seems just a few days ago even. Three days. Three days max and you can smell it all the way from here. And there you have the clear evidence he met his end with people chopping away at his tusks. And this is really the front line. This is as far as they come. They will no longer move across eastern Namibia into Angola and Zambia, fearful of the consequences of poaching. But this elephant was in Botswana, and still it's not safe. The cozy pretense that Botswana is the stronghold for Africa's elephants appears to have been completely blown out the water with people moving into but well within Botswana's borders to poach elephants. But just how bad is it across the continent? The truth is, nobody knew until Chase and a team of scientists conducted the Great Elephant Census. Hundreds of air crew counted elephants in 18 countries across the continent over two years. All right, start counting. Elephant seven. Seven elephants, right, well done. Their results more shocking than anyone imagined. We spent thousands of hours of trancing, flying over areas where elephants historically occurred, but are no longer present in these habitats. Killed for their ivory, in seven short years, up to 2014, elephant numbers have dropped by a staggering amount, almost one third. It's incredibly disheartening. Some landscapes, we saw more dead elephants than live elephants. You've grown up in this country, you are from Botswana. What is it like to see these magnificent beasts killed like this? I don't think anybody in the world has seen the number of dead elephants that I've seen over the last two years at the Great Elephant Census. And for me, this becomes a lot more personal. It's at home. And, you know, I've often been asked if I'm optimistic or pessimistic about the future of African elephants. And on days like today, I feel that we are failing elephants. Why is now the time to act? On a continental scale, elephants don't have time. The haunting statistic for me is in the two years of the Great Elephant Census, we may have lost upwards of 70,000 elephants. Who are we to sentence a species to extinction? Future generations will judge us. And Mike Chase's efforts to tag elephants with satellite collars prove that elephants are avoiding danger. So you can hear him snoring. Oh, is it a he yeah. or a she? He is in his prime, about 30 to 35 years of age, 
And it's these young bulls that have the propensity to move dramatic distances and map their transboundary conservation corridors. The GPS technology provides us with the ability to safeguard and protect elephants. It's quite incredible being this close to this animal. It is. It certainly is. For every elephant that Mike Chase and his team try to keep safe, another is brutally cut down. An iconic species vanishing from the African continent. These animals are facing incalculable odds. And it's not just poaching, it's habitat loss, human elephant conflict, retaliatory killings, climate change. Look how remote and wild this area is. You know, these are issues which are confronting us as well. And if we can't conserve the African elephant, I'm fearful to think about the fate of the rest of Africa's wildlife. This is Nosy and Drangambala, a tiny fishing community off the coast of East Africa. It's home to only a few dozen people, and among them are Hari and Lydia, who are raising six children. This family knows this reef better than anyone, and until recently, they never saw coral this damaged. Extreme heat this year has caused coral all around the world to start to suffocate and turn ghostly white. The aftermath looks like a disaster zone, or the ruins of an ancient city. No one here can make sense of it. Scientists do know what's going on. Divers surveyed these waters during a heat wave in April, and they say that about 70% of the reef here was damaged by the high temperatures. This is a clear sign of climate change. We're causing this damage by burning fossil fuels, heating up the oceans, and making them more acidic. But Lydia, she's only been in a car once in her life. She may not understand the science, but she does know what she sees. The family's response to the vanishing coral? Work harder. Hari and his sons cast lines deep into the ocean, while Lydia walks the reef flats in search of octopus. These skills are passed between generations. Hari and Lydia are Vezu, and that name means at struggle with the sea. It's hard to imagine people who are more connected to the water. When Vezu children are born, their umbilical cords are placed in a shell like this one, and then that's tossed into the ocean as a sort of offering. Right from birth, they are part of the reef. There's no fresh water, electricity, or school out here. There's no plan B. It's too expensive for Hari and Lydia to give their kids an education off the island, so the kids simply must learn to fish and sail. But climate change is putting all of this in jeopardy. Thousands of miles away, we continue to burn fossil fuels, which is heating up the oceans and making them more acidic. That's killing the coral, which 275 million people depend on for their survival. And here is where they feel it most. I told Lydia that scientists expect coral reefs worldwide to disappear by 2050 because of climate change. That's about when her children will be grown. She looked back at me and said she thinks of the white coral almost like a curse, one sent from my people to hers. Before we left, Lydia asked a question about our visit. When we went back home, would we teach people about Madagascar, she asked. Would we tell them about the little kids and their toy boats, about how much they need the reef and this ocean? Would people see the harm that they're causing? I told her yes, but honestly, I worry those of us causing the coral to vanish won't care enough to stop. Another form of pollution is wreaking havoc in the Pacific. If trends continue, the ocean could become more parts plastic than fish by weight by 2050. This is Midway Atoll in the Pacific Ocean, one of the most remote places on the planet, 
and home to the world's largest single albatross colony. At its peak, 1.5 million albatross nest here. Matt Brown, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, lived here for years and is our guide. You've got the birds in the air, you've got the birds on the ground, the nesting seabirds. And so when you look at it from this scope, it looks like fairly pristine landscape that's sort of devoid of, of the imprint of man. But that's far from the truth. Yes, only 40 people live on Midway, the area, a national wildlife refuge, and one of the largest protected areas on the planet. But something very unnatural is happening here. Well, Dawn lets you see just how unbelievably beautiful this place is. So pristine here, you almost don't want to touch it or disturb it. But the tide has left a line of trash all along the beach here, pretty much as far as your eye can see. We're 1,300 miles from the nearest city, but the shores here are littered with scraps from the modern world. A shoe, a helmet, a shampoo bottle, even a plastic mannequin's head. What is that? What is Tea, something's warmed yeah. up in the sun. I wouldn't open it. No, I'm not going to open it. Don't worry. It's fine. It's all right. Since 1999, NOAA has removed 125 metric tons of debris from Midway. This is just the last few years' worth stacked on the runway, waiting for a ship to take it away. So, how does it all get here? North Pacific gyre swirls between Asia and North America, and as it does, it collects trash and garbage from the coast of Asia, from the coast of North America, and that all swirls down towards the middle, which is where Midway sits. And we're like the fingers of a comb or a giant sieve here, so as that current swings around, we are seeing tons and tons of garbage collect on our beach. What collects on the beach is just part of the problem. To fully understand how polluted our oceans are, we turn to Midway's main resident, the Laysan albatross. This is a bird that spends 90 plus percent of its life in the ocean, on the water, forages across the breadth of the Pacific to capture food and come back to the chicks here on this island. Devoid of predators, devoid of people, it is the perfect location. Still, natural selection claims the lives of thousands of albatross chicks every year. Matt cuts open a bird, dead, for only a matter of days. So, as you open it up, you can see... That's incredible. ...all that plastic that's inside this bird. The same colors that distinguish this brand make it appeal to birds as food, too. It's the color of squid. In a healthy, perfectly pristine ocean, they're grabbing squid, they're grabbing fish eggs, and then they fly back here and they feed that to their chick. The problem is they've eaten a cigarette lighter. They'll fly that all the way back from the center of the ocean and feed it to their chick here. When we find chicks that didn't make it and you look as the carcass decomposes, the feathers will dissolve, the bones will dissolve, but what's left behind is that plastic. You get this perfect little circle of a bottle cap and a piece of broken spoon and a, a lighter. Pick up a handful of dirt virtually anywhere on the island and you'll find bits of plastic. Every year, albatross adults bring five tons of plastic back to Midway, along with the food they're trying to feed their chicks. Despite these challenges, Midway is considered a success story in conservation. We have made this as perfect a habitat as we can for albatross, and we've seen those numbers increase. The problem is the things that we can't control. These islands are slowly disappearing because of global sea level rise. They're impacted by illegal fishing industries. The plastics that the birds bring in take the place of valuable food that they need. The threats to these birds are beyond the shores of Midway. The threats to these birds are global. Great. And there she is, just another one of the common bumblebees. Bee vacuum in one hand and net in the other, Robin Thorpe is on a quest. So we're coming into the area where I last saw Franklin. He's searching the mountains of Oregon for Franklin's bumblebee. It's a species he's believed to be the last person on earth to have seen alive. And he's got a sample of the bee in the back of his truck. It's from the 1950s. And this is Franklin's, and you can see she has a black face, a little touch of whitish hair, that's pretty subtle. This is a bee that could be extinct in the wild. Could be. I'm not willing to give up on it, but uh, I'm hoping it's still out there under the radar. 
The last time he saw it was 2006, exactly 10 years before he invited me to join him. Thorpe is 83 now, a retired professor from UC Davis, and mostly he works alone, day after day, year after year. It's like something out of Hemingway, the old man and the bee. Yeah, at times it's, uh, it's kind of a lonely task, but I don't really get wrapped up in that. I've got the bumblebees for company, basically, and I enjoy that. And bees already are showing signs of rapid decline. Scientists say that pesticides, farms, climate change, and disease all are to blame. Franklin's bumblebee is a particularly dramatic example, but a quarter of our bumblebee species in North America face extinction risk. I think it's an alarming number. If this happens and many of our bumblebee species do go extinct, we might start to see a loss in some of the ecosystem function that bumblebees provide. You also should know that bees pollinate 35% of the world's crops. That's a service that's worth billions of dollars per year. So basically, the, when we get the bees, they come in a box like this. As wild bees disappear, commercial bumblebees are becoming popular in greenhouses like this one in British Columbia. The bees are raised in a factory some 2,000 miles away, and then they're flown in by plane. Think of them almost like cows on a farm. They're domesticated insects. They're great workers. They put in a lot of time. They basically go from sunup to sunset and uh, they work seven days a week, so they do a great job for us. The bees buzz each flower, shaking out pollen and helping it reproduce. Without them, tomato growers would have to pollinate their crops by hand. But here's the irony. The commercial bee industry may be contributing to the decline of wild bees. The research isn't conclusive, but Robin Thorpe and others believe that greenhouse bees are carrying diseases into wild bee populations, and that that may have killed Franklin's bumblebee. Most told me that his greenhouse takes precautions to prevent that. Queen bees are trapped in their boxes so they don't create new colonies, and the bees are incinerated after eight weeks in the greenhouse. No one knows for certain what caused Franklin's bumblebee to disappear from California and Oregon, but it's clear we're doing something to cause these once common species to vanish. Is your gut that Franklin's bumblebee is still out here somewhere? I'm hoping so. Uh, that's about the best I can say. Obviously, uh, since it hasn't been seen in 10 years, uh, every year that goes by, it uh, makes the chances of finding more and more doubtful because they have to reproduce every year. Just got to keep searching. Yeah, right. So that's the basis for the quest. I spent two days looking for Franklin's bumblebee with Thorpe. I found the work absolutely maddening. The ones that you hear fly by your ear, I'm always suspicious. well, that meant, must have been a Franklin. I don't think you can put an economic value on a species. They're all priceless, really. But uh, Franklin's is one that I've had a lot of uh, personal investment in. And uh, yeah, I feel uh, an attachment and kinship to it. I'm not sure whether he'll find it, but maybe that's beside the point. The truth is that for anyone to know a species like Franklin's bumblebee had vanished, someone like Thorpe has to be looking. In the Costa Rican rainforest, it's sound, not sight, that's helping some researchers track the disappearance of amphibians. These creatures are vanishing at an alarming rate, and their plight may be a window into the troubled future of all species on Earth. Out here in the Costa Rican rainforest, ecologist Brian Pijanowski is setting up high-tech microphones to listen for the sound of extinction. What sort of frogs would you expect to hear? A lot of tree frogs out here, probably strawberry poison dart frogs. I'm listening to what I call the rhythm of nature or its tempo, the amphibians and the insects. And if they're there, it tells me that it's basically a healthy ecosystem. If they're not there, I get to be very worried. In the past 30 years or so, we've seen really dramatic, really rapid extinctions for frog populations all over the world. Many of these extinctions are due to habitat loss, but other extinctions have occurred in pristine rainforests like this, places that look healthy, but the frogs are telling us there's something clearly wrong. For frogs, climate change and a killer fungus called chytrid, which humans help spread around the world, are causing much of the problem. There are several poison frogs calling right around here. We could go try to track one down. All right. To try to understand it, Stephen Whitfield spent years walking through the rainforest here at La Selva Biological Station. Oh, here it is. Counting and observing frogs. What are some of the sounds you hear? Um, there's a, um, a frog up. That clack, 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 clack. That's a frog that you can hear from a fairly long distance. There we go again. Yep. <laughs> 
He'll be the first to tell you that it's not easy work. There have been many occasions where I'm doing surveys for frogs, and I'll hear one call and spend half an hour or more looking into a small patch of vegetation, knowing that it's right there and that I need to find it, but unable to see it. That's where Pijanowski comes in. He and collaborators from around the world have been installing microphone sensors on the forest floor and up high in the canopy. The goal? Listen for changes that biologists like Whitfield might not be able to see. How many of these sensors are all around the forest here? At the height of our study, we had 34. Wow. It could become a record of extinction. Pijanowski has audio recordings for this forest dating back to 2008, and already he's hearing signs of trouble. He showed me how he uses computer algorithms to analyze the sound and pick out the species trends. He visualizes these massive audio files in charts called spectrograms. When you're in the tropics, you look at a spectrogram, it's full, it's, it's rich, because we have thousands of animals here. But when I see something like a spectrogram like this, where we have this large gap, and it's dark. These kinds of differences are ones that you begin to ask serious questions. But there are some trends so obvious that Pijanowski hears them before the computers do. He tells me that in 2015, he was alarmed at how quiet the forest sounded. Take a listen to this file from 2008. And then another from 2015, recorded in similar conditions. Those are just two moments, but look how clear the difference becomes when you look at nearly a year's worth of recordings. You can see the animals making more noise in red. Again, here's 2008 and 2015. Pijanowski says it's too early to draw scientific conclusions, but he is frightened. I'm worried that these would potentially become acoustic fossils. In other words, the animals that are in these files are no longer alive. The only record that we have of some of their presence is in an audio recording. That is somewhat disturbing to me as a scientist and also as a, as a citizen of this planet. What happens if they're gone? I mean, some of the theoretical work that we're doing in ecology suggests that we could have ecosystem collapse, and that's not good. You don't want to start removing organisms and, and expect the ecosystem to survive and function in a healthy way. It could very well mean that the, some of the things that we are much more emotionally attached to are lost. Do you feel like you've already heard the six extinctions starting? I think so. You know, I've been only listening for about 15 to 20 years and making a record of it through these recordings. There is evidence of that. There is evidence all around the world in just about every ecosystem.